Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and thanks again for the invitation. Um, are you seeing my slides in slideshow mode now? Yes. So again, thanks very much to the Social Responsiveness Committee for, for the invitation to speak to you. It, it really is a privilege to be able to, to think a little bit about the things that I often say off the cuff. And so today I've titled my talk, To Whom Shall We Account? And it is an important question for me in, in, and I think what has happened through the course of the COVID pandemic is that we've increasingly been called to account for more than the space that we're used to. We've been called to account to many of those around us who ordinarily we may not have engaged with um, actively. I want to, Kamarodi Chais is the name that the original peoples on this land had for this place of observatory. It means the place of the stars. And for me, in engaging with the original Khoi people and their descendants, or their descendants rather, at the end of last year, was really quite an important moment of locating myself on this ground. And I want to acknowledge those first peoples in this space, because in many ways, this lecture is an echo of that kind of recognition of ancestors. I looked up a bit on, on Lauren Ecclesio and found really, and I've taken these bits and pieces out of the um, newsletter last year, because many of the things that, that, that are listed here are things that resonate in the way I think of the space. So in many ways, Lauren Ecclesio's memory becomes one of the stars of the firmament that we look at from this space and recognize her for having been here as she now becomes one of our ancestors. But these are the themes that came through in that report. Social responsiveness, a PhD graduate, died early in 2018. I've changed the orders of these attributes that were, were listed in that piece, but I do recognize her as a mother and wife in the first instance, an academic, a businesswoman and an entrepreneur, because I think key to the research enterprise is the sense of entrepreneurship. But also that, that, that story about her and, and this lecture spoke of her power to, of her recognition of the power of research to transform communities and highlighted her, her enthusiasm for participatory action research. I'm going to use many of those words again and again today, but I thought it would be useful to start and locate what I'm saying today in the words of Akil Mbembe. Akil Mbembe, writes from a, a humanities point of view, and this is what he had to say about universities and our responsibilities as institutions of higher learning. It's in, in order to set our institutions firmly on the path of future knowledges, we need to reinvent a classroom without walls in which we are all co-learners. A university that is capable of convening various publics in new forms of assemblies, so that those assemblies become points of convergence of, convergence of and platforms for the redistribution of different kinds of knowledges. I'm gonna reflect on this notion of how we distribute that knowledge once we have recognized it to be co-constructed with people, with ordinary people outside of the academy. My talk will take four steps really. I'm gonna reflect a little bit on the sustainable development goals. I'm gonna speak about social accountability in as much as it means to me what I would like to see translated into our enterprise of education. I'm going to refer to the knowledge democracy, a term I have to say I, I, I discovered in my reading for today, um, because I was forced to go and look at what people are saying about the things I think about. And then I want to speak very strongly about the idea of to whom shall we account. In 2015, this 2013 Agenda for Sustainable Development was launched by the United Nations. And in many ways, the, the fact that we're continually having to renew our commitments to a changed world, often underpinned on this idea that we can create a more equal society. But as we keep doing this, we keep reminding ourselves of the purpose that we have and the purpose that we particularly have from our positions of power, particularly in, high, in higher education institutions. But the, the summary at the beginning of this document speaks about these, these goals being about people, 
the need for equality and, and emancipation of many peoples across the world, the idea of, of the planet and the fact that the environment becomes a really important part of the interaction and the sustainable of peoples, prosperity, and interestingly, the definitions of prosperity may have to be redefined in many ways. I mean, I'm quite struck in our current context at how the rich have got extraordinarily richer in the period of COVID. And, and they, they, there seems to be this misalignment or malalignment of, of what accountability means. <clears throat> it speaks of peace. And, you know, in the, in the 80s, one of the things that we often spoke about is the fact that peace is not something you just get. It's a consequence of a just environment. You're much less likely to, to fight about anything if, if people are, or, or have access to the things that make them uh, comfortable and, and prosperous. And then partnership. And it's really the partnership idea that I will continue through the, the, this lecture this afternoon. Last week at the, at the research symposium, uh, Salome Maswime, our professor of global surgery, summarized these five Ps as being people, the environment, and the relationship between them. And this, this tension of partnership and relationship is one I'll come back to throughout the course of this afternoon. But I wanted to just show you this again, and I've no doubt you've seen this in many talks. And this was the point at which I was going to use a, a, a poll, but I thought I wouldn't take any chances. But I want you just to look at this picture of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and just try to think for yourself which really resonates for you. And the reality, colleagues, I suspect, is that it's one or the other, or it's both, and it's this one, and then it's another. But in many ways, I think what this demonstrates to us is the interconnectedness of all of these dimensions. And I think that underpinning all of this is, is our commitment as a deanery, for instance, to say we need to ignite agency to build an inclusive and just society built on health equity. Because all of these dimensions, even though health is explicitly mentioned in sustainable in SDG3, all of these things bring us closer to a sense of health equity across the world. And I think what we increasingly are reflecting on in these restatements is how do we hold people accountable, both ourselves, as well as the governments and the institutions that we operate with? How do we hold them accountable? And so in 2004, the World Bank spoke about social accountability and they've developed a strong theme of social accountability over the years, but they spoke about the fact that social accountability relies on civic engagement. It's the place where ordinary citizens and civic organizations can participate directly or indirectly in exacting accountability. Now, perhaps it's a, a useful time now to, to, to raise the challenge about when last did you feel challenged about your accountability? And what was your response to that? In that document from the World Bank, they speak about this notion of, of the three uh, areas that are interacting in terms of accountability. Much of their work is around civic accountability and the idea that, um, that in society, in, in government particularly, there needs to be a greater level of accountability. But they create these two notions of accountability. They speak about the long root of accountability, which, which emerges from the voice of the people, the citizens, calling on the state to do something or the other. In his book, Adam Habib in 2013, in his book entitled Suspended Revolutions, he calls this substantive uncertainty. And he, 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 he makes the comparison that in South African society, we haven't reached the point where the state, the politicians and, and policymakers feel this substantive uncertainty. They, there's very much a sense that election after election, people will return them to power. And so they have been unable to close the loop of accountability. This client power offers us a short route for accountability. And in many ways, that's the notion of, of, of the social accountability that, 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 is, that I subscribe to very strongly is how do we shorten the gap 
between ordinary people and the institutions and organizations that they wish to hold accountable. In 1995 already, when it was still fashionable to speak about medical schools as places where health professionals were taught, Bullen and Hick uh, crafted this definition that the definition of social, social accountability spoke to the obligation of higher education institutions to direct their education, research and service activities towards addressing the priority health concerns of the community, the region or the nation that they're mandated to serve. Now there's a challenge in that because universities like ourselves often are not able to define with any kind of, of reference point what the community is. And that's part of our journey that we're hoping to engage on as a, a dean at least, try and engage with this sense of who is the community that we want to be most closely associated with, so that if we associate with them over a period of 20 years, they know that we made a difference because we were there. The NETS Training for Health Equity Network has produced a template by which we can assess what we do. They ask four questions. What needs are we addressing? In other words, whose needs are we responding to? Um, one of my, one of the sayings that one of the students made for me um, and one that I reflect on with great longing was them saying, yes, we can work in primary care, but we do it in Canada because it's so much easier. The questions of how do we work? What does our organization look like? What do we do? And then ultimately, what difference do we make? Do the people on the Cape Flats really perceive that their lives are different because UCT students learn on that platform? And then in terms of measuring what we do, these are some of the questions on the right hand side that, that, that we might ask from the, the, the framework might ask of us. And today I'm going to focus a little bit on does our research program relate to the mission and values of social accountability. So Dan referred to the fact that my PhD was on social accountability um, and, and I completed that in 2014. And the graphic that I'm showing here emerged from my conversations with the community. So I sampled um, eight groups of people across rural and urban environments. And I was trying to understand from them how they held their doctors to account. And it was a medical based degree because um, in the assessment committee, the, the assessor said, um, unless I wanted to spend a lifetime doing the PhD, I needed to localize it to only one profession. So I was very grateful at the end of the day. But, but colleagues, what this did, so I spoke to, to people who were not in the queue at institutions. So I spoke to one of the groups was a, um, a group of traditional healers up in Pushpat Ridge. The other was a group that gathered in a church. Another group was young people. Um, and a variety of people that I actually didn't predetermine the structure of the groups. Um, and I thought that was really important for me because what came through very powerfully for me is that ordinary people, the people who would become our patients, have no way of constructing a relationship of accountability with their doctors at all. And so in reconstructing the qualitative process, I was forced to ask them, what is good doctoring then? If we can't hold them to account, what does a good doctor look like? And so this model emerged. I'm not a great Ubuntu fan, but it was one of those occasions where I was forced to rethink my own um, uh, jaded views of Ubuntu. And they speak very powerfully. And, and colleagues at the bottom here, you'll see that this is the side on which the health professionals exist with their power and empowerment. They have the tools with which they can impart some level of power if they're prepared to give it up and communities start in this position of vulnerability. And there's a, a unique space between them in which all sorts of things are going on. And, and when, this, when these, these people constructed the, the consultation as a place of love and respect, they were very clear that love and respect was not a cuddlesome activity. It was really a robust engagement of two, of two adult people. The sense in this, in this model, and it's trying to create a dynamism that as, the, as people's rights improve and their recognition of their own um, uh, entitlements increases, there's a growing level of responsibility for them as well as for the, for the uh, health practitioners. And then they enter this relationship. 
And they, they, they spoke of this fact that it is the Ubuntu framing of all of the relationships that becomes crucially important for their engagement with health professionals. I want to come back a little bit later to relationship um, and talk a little bit more about that. This is a picture of, of the church in which um, I conducted one of the focus groups. Um, the pastor of the, of the church um, allowed me to use that space. And for me, it's a photo I've used again and again since I did this interview in 2012, because it reminds me of the question about how we frame to whom shall we account. Often we create images that are out there uh, in terms of, 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 of who we're accounting to. I used this slide last year because it was 50 years after the writing of the Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. And Paulo Freire was the one that many ascribe the origins of, um, of PBL learning to. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that, that, that that's a direct, uh, uh, we can ascribe it so directly myself. But he speaks about this idea that people develop their power to perceive critically the way they exist in the world with which and in which they find themselves. They come to see the world not as a static reality, but as a reality in process, in transformation. And so colleagues, I've taken the liberty in the next slide to actually just pick up a couple of Freirian quotations that came from this paper uh, by Orlowski in 2019, speaking about the intersections of participatory action research and, the, and teaching for social justice. Very much it's a paper based in the, in the, in the context of, um, of uh, of education. And the first one I thought was really quite important. We can only consider ourselves to be the subjects of our decisions, our searchings, our capacity to choose. That is as historical subjects, as people capable of transforming our world if we are grounded ethically. Now you'll see that, that these are the words that Freya used in the original book about conscientization, the fact that um, as people learn, learning should be a thing that creates a conscientization in them so that they look at the world a little bit differently. In one of the responses about participatory action research that I thought really captured the sense of the way I thought about uh, action research is about understanding and improving the world by changing it. At its heart is collective self-reflective inquiry that both the researchers and participants undertake. And for me, that's quite an important idea that, that in our research process and participatory action research for me reveals that idea that the knowledge is often created in the pursuit of the knowledge. So the process of, of engaging in research is often what teaches us a whole lot of things. Donald Macedo in that same article speaks about the fact that if students are not able to transform their lived experiences into knowledge and to use the already acquired knowledge as a process to unveil new knowledge, they will never be able to participate rigorously in the dialogue as a process of learning and knowing. And, 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 one of, and I think this is absolutely true of how professional students who often come into our situation from significantly disadvantaged environments. And they're often learning for our benefit because as teachers, we teach from very positivistic uh, uh, standpoints and we expect the students to become like us. I'm quite challenged in the PhD that I'm currently supervising about the students' notions of professionalism during the fees must fall environment. They've now graduated or they're in final year and their reflections are really about whose professionalism is professionalism and how do we recognize ourselves in the constructions of, of professionalism. It's a dialogue that's taking the, Ameri the Americas by storm at the moment in the Black Lives Matter aftermath. But perhaps this, this quotation from Freer captures what, what I want us to think about as we think about our teaching endeavor and our research endeavor. The teacher of the students and the students of the teacher cease to exist and a new term emerges, teacher student with student teachers. The teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but one who is himself or herself taught in dialogue with the students who in turn while being taught, also teach. 
And for me, that's quite an emancipatory idea for our students particularly, and, our, and, and the students that we will take into research and enterprises. How do we ensure that we open ourselves to their learnings? I'm always mindful that I, I spoke to a young student the other day who, when he traveled from Gauteng, from Timbisa to, to Cape Town, he had never been out of Gauteng. And he was able to navigate himself on the bus, took a taxi, got to the residence he was assigned to. How do we value that kind of knowing? Because it's certainly a higher skill than driving the car your, your father got you for Christmas down the road from um, Bishop's Court into UCT. How do we value those tense knowings from different environments? And Barker, uh, the scholarships was an idea that Boyer raised in the early 90s and referred to the different ways that we engage with scholarship across the board. But Barker offers a very nice description of what the scholarship of engagement is, and he offers a taxonomy I'll share in the next slide. But it's this idea of scholarship being more than just a, 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 a small suite of things. It is about research, teaching, integration, and then applying our knowledges as we accumulate them. But it speaks very powerfully of the reciprocation that we have with civic engagement and the way we value our relationships with communities. This is his taxonomy that he offers um, about the practices that will deepen our sense of engagement. Because engaged scholarship is about looking at what we know in a much broader uh, swathe of, of thinking processes. And these five com uh, components is what he offers. Public scholarship, participatory research, community partnerships, and those community partnerships in a very valued way that is, is, is the reciprocal nature of those is really important. Public information networks, here a, a bit of an emphasis on the asset-based approaches to communities. All too often we go to communities because they don't have. And here, what this is valuing is the fact that communities already have networks that we could learn from. And then the idea of the civic skills and civic literacies that are embedded in communities when we, when we start engaging them as research subjects. Then, as I, this, this idea of knowledge democracy, the idea that many people can participate in the creation of knowledges. And, and what is really interesting for me in this paper was that uh, Leslie Wood and others embarked on seven workshops across the world. They did one in, in, in Anglophone Africa, as well as Francophone Africa, as well as some in, in the, some of these workshops happened in the, uh, in the South American continent. And what he, what he says, what they say, what this team then finds from this series of workshops through their analysis is that knowledge is complex. But I think we're a group of people who understand that. But we also understand, and increasingly this notion is being highlighted in people's writing, is that the role and the use and abuse of knowledge is also complex. How knowledge is used to both liberate and suppress is a key thing. And I use liberate and suppress in the most liberal sense, because I think in all of our relationships, where there's a level of asymmetry, we must apply this, this concept of liberation. How do we democratize knowledge from our positions of privilege? In fact, the article is saying that the workshops question whether we do have the capacity to do that. What are the things that we would give up in doing that? Then the status of, of, of discipline specific knowledge and the extent to which it includes or excludes. And it's often difficult for us to challenge the dominant cultures. And you'll see this emerging in the discourse around what global health is global health. And to what extent are the agendas from a northern based uh, framing of global health limiting the, the, the conversations that uh, we need to have. So for me personally, my, my vocabulary now says global health equity, because that begins to introduce the notions that equity has got to underpin all of our thinking around global health. And then the question of sharing and dissemination of knowledge. I think every, all of you must have seen the, the numerous pieces that have come up, particularly in the, in the, in the COVID environment uh, where people are challenging um, who decides what gets published, where it gets published, and how much the poor have to pay for that publication. Um, this team um, um, 
kind of alerted me to a really interesting piece written by uh, Gumete, Jerome Gumete, Jerome Tamsanga Gumete. And I say that quite intentionally because he writes a piece in, in the Education Journal of Living Theories. And, and it's, it's a journal, it appears that, where people write about theories as they're emerging. But Jerome speaks in the article of his journey to living theory development of, as a Black African Zulu male educator. And he uses all of those words quite intentionally. This is the opening lines of his abstract. The article is an outcome of my doctoral journey and the challenges of developing my living theory. It's to give insights to the journey I undertook. And I look at the in, incommensurability between cultures, the oral versus the literate, and how do we recognize these different ways of knowing and expressing if we're going to value knowings in a different way, which is really the, the, the context of our research. Our agenda for research is about recreating knowledge. But whose knowledge will we value? And whose knowledge will our knowledge look like? The opening line of, of, of Jerome Kumede's article speaks about the fact that he, his, his living theory is based on Ubuntu and Uhlonipa. Um, Uhlonipa is a, is a really reverential uh, declaration of respect. But he doesn't speak about the outcome of his research. He speaks about the learnings that he acquired during the, 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 the research. And I just found this a really fascinating piece. And I thought it would be a really useful one for me to conclude on. Um, but this page, this next slide really captures for me, he, he describes himself as a young man who didn't like to watch TV because he felt it was a waste of time. Every minute of his life was occupied and he did stuff all the time. But he says what happened when he, as he was studying rural, uh, uh, the northern parts of Zululand, I think that's the area he was doing his study in, um, is how pressured he was, how he learned patience because the concepts of time in the community that he was studying were so different to his own. And so in his, in his engaging with concepts of time, he speaks about these different concepts from the Zulu language of the descriptions of time. And, and already in that, in that construction of time, we ourselves as, as a predominantly Western environment are in tension with this concept of time as part of a lived reality rather than a static thing that occurs once or not. Um, and he, he gives a few of these, and I, I'll try to read them for you. Um, and this I thought is a really rich one where the snails are retreating to their shelter in the morning or at dawn. Um, where people's shadows are long at midday. Um, I like the one because there was a TV program named after it, Sela Matunzi, in the evening when only the silhouettes of objects can be seen, and Kungundege Amecho is when the eyes can't see as you would expect them. And, and for me, I, I, the, the last one there, which I thought was really uh, um, powerful, and I've never heard these, even though I have some Zulu, Parati Kwa Mabili, literally means the time between the two. Um, and, and, and it's this notion of midnight in a way that we, we may construct it, or I may construct it, if we not make assumptions for you. I may construct it as a continuum of time. And I can see how in the description of Pagati Guamabili, that this time between the two days may be more substantial than just the click of a clock from one day into the next. And then Kuzem Pondo Zamnenke is dawn. And I thought the power of this piece really allows us to engage with a young man who comes to this learning initially feeling the resistance of inadequacy, feeling that he didn't belong in the space of a doctoral uh, project. He'd already completed a master's, but that didn't seem to carry him through in the, in the spirit of the doctorate. He knew he could, but he felt that he didn't belong. And so colleagues, I want to conclude with these two remarks, but these are my last two slides. Um, Hall and, and their team write about knowledge, democracy, and action. They speak into the space of community engagement through a series of case studies. But I really like this notion that 
even as we are trying to shake off the effects of a COVID change of life, so to speak, we have to recreate ourselves. And there are a number of cliches that abound in that space, not least of which is this idea of building back better. But if we're to build back better, then we have to accept that we have to emerge with a new architect of, architecture of knowledge. The way we know has got to be different. And so we've got, they claim, and this is the we is them, the authors, we approach engagement in ways that accept the multiple sites and epistemologies of knowledge. But most importantly for me, the recipro reciprocity and mutuality in learning and education through engagement. The coming into an engaged space with a sense that I don't have the knowledge, we can co-create this knowledge space together. I mean, the other day we started our, our uh, listening circles with the students. Uh, we unfortunately only had one who came, but it was quite interesting his reticence the student who came's reticence to engage in telling his story. Because one could see that he has a construct of which story is acceptable in the space. And so when we shared our stories, it became easy for him to tell his story. And this is that for me, the reciprocity and mutuality in learning and education through engagement. And so colleagues, I want to say that in answer to the question, to whom shall we account? We can only account to those with whom we have nurtured a valued relationship. When we say that we are community-based, but we only visit for certain activities and we're not immersed in that community's life and its struggles, don't think we can account to that community. I don't think we can, we can say that we are accountable to our students if we don't engage with them in spaces other than are defined by our, our notion of knowledge. And so colleagues, I, I want to pay tribute to, to people like Lauren Ecclesio who have come through the UCT environment and clearly have left legacies which have changed the nature of who we are. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Green Thompson. Um, so uh, let's... Um, uh, open it up for discussion. I mean, I think I think you really articulately and inspiringly put forward your vision, which emphasizes key values, including um, participating with the community and social justice. So I think I think there'll be a lot to say. 